encourage you to do so uh, because it's better I just go slow and you understand and you ask questions because things build up quite a bit uh, in terms of understanding uh, throughout these couple of hours we have. So please feel free to interrupt. Um, and, and I'll tell you one thing, just to make it so that you feel maybe more easily at, able to ask me questions, is that I've been obsessed with Korea for many years, so I'm very happy to be here for one particular reason. I have a misspent youth with an awful lot of StarCraft that I played. Like, I played a lot of StarCraft. So I was like always obsessed with Korean culture and, and getting to Korea at some point, so I'm very happy to have been here. That's actually the case. All right, so anyways, um, I'm going to tell you about the, the the SMAP, I'll refer to that acronym as a SMAP, and I'm going to build throughout this week to hopefully get you to understand why we're starting to refer to it as the GeoSMAP or Geometric SMAP. And you saw a little bit of that in Cliff's lectures, but hopefully it'll become very clear as a practical application why this kind of uh, abstract idea is actually, uh, in terms of interpreting actual collider data, are actually useful going forward. So let's get going. Let's see how far we get. I can do this. Okay. So this is what I'm going to try and do. I'm going to try and introduce the stem all EFT, the SMAT, uh, with an eye towards the Higgs and the Higgs like scale that we discovered. Uh, and that'll be today. And I'll basically just talk a little bit about it in kind of general terms, introductory, and with a symmetry orientation, and, and talk a little bit about something which is an old kind of EFT interpretation in a sense of some collider data, in particular lap collider data, which is the ST interpretation of electric precision data to compare it to how we're now thinking about it in the standard model effective field theory of this map. And in, in the second lecture, which will come in a little well, today, <laughs> in a, after a break, we'll get to primary county in the standard model of this map. Uh, again, with symmetry guidance, it's all about symmetry in large degree. And I'll compare it to a modern electric precision data interpretation in s &T. and uh, we'll talk a little bit about input parameters and that sort of thing. And then later in the week, uh, I'll talk to you about W mass interpretation, you know, this anomaly that appeared and how this map is kind of perfect for thinking about such, such deviations. Uh, and, and also the hierarchy problem with an idea of trying to orienting how big these effects are that we're looking for with these techniques. And then I'll do two examples. One is, uh, is, is basically the Higgs width example, and the other is the W mass interpretation of this map. Just kind of see like if these effects are real, if we start to see deviations, when can we start to get excited to think that we're really starting to indirectly study this young standard model? And then the last lecture, I'm going to go beyond the order and talking about loops and talking about dimension eight corrections, which will lead very naturally into the geometric SMAP stuff, which hopefully will be very, very clear by the end of the week, and we'll have a, like a more focused advanced seminar on that sort of thing. So these three reviews at the bottom, I think, are pretty good. One, I wrote the first one on the SMAP, uh, and I learned a lot from Anish Manohar and Cliff Burgess, who wrote those other two reviews. So you should think of me as kind of like some synergy of those two guys, because they basically trained me in, in how I think. And I learned a lot from them, so you can learn a lot from them too if you look at those reviews. So let's get going, and let's just give a bit of gentle introduction as to why we're thinking this way, using EFT techniques this way. Uh, in the last 10 years, it's become particularly the, the focus of the field. So let's see if I can actually, okay. So this is what I'm gonna talk about today, motivation, Massive vectors and scalars, and why at least a Higgs like particle, and the Higgs with custodial symmetry and thinking about electric precision data, and then some, something about cutoff scales, which will also lead a little bit into Rodrigo's lectures introductory. Uh, he'll, he'll take on the heft uh, in the next the session tomorrow. Okay, so motivation. So the motivation is basically, as any good motivation in my mind for theoretical work, is the data. Okay, so the basic situation is that we have an enormous amount of data. Believe it or not, although it doesn't seem like that, and sometimes. Uh, you're living the best possible time in the history, uh, in particular for particle physics experiments in terms of data gathering. So there's lots of different data, I'm not going to go into all these sorts of things, but we basically have some order one theoretical understandings of the data that we see, and we're looking for small perturbations, in particular in collider physics experiments, and that's where the EFT techniques come in. And the data has been growing over many, many, many years, and it used to be that EFT techniques weren't so dominant compared to the way they are now. And that's basically a response to what was going on in the field in terms of how the experiments were advancing in terms of energy levels and what we were finding. So what I'm showing you here on the left and the right is something called a Livingston chart. So what that is, is it shows you as a function of time, the basic the center mass energy of certain particle physics experiments when they were kind of like first turned on. And in the past, you can see, all you need to see is that there was lots of experiments and they were going up very rapidly with energy, okay? And when that was happening, we were finding lots of new particles all the time. So the dominant approach in the field was doing model building because, well, what are these things and how we put them in a coherent model structure was the very sensible thing to do. So as time has gone on, 
what has happened is essentially on this side, and we're still going up in energy. We have LHC and we have LHC into the future. But what's happened is a bit of a turnover in terms of us racing forward in terms of energy, although some future machines might push us up again. And we're getting a lot of data at some of energies which we've kind of already had a first look at what's going on, and we're looking for small perturbations. Okay, so this is just changing basically our mentality. And in this sort of scenario where we have a lot of data that we're taking at energy scales, which we've kind of started to probe already, uh, effective filtration are essentially the, the key tool to trying to look for small deviations from your expectation. So going forward, that's what's going to happen. We're going to get 3,000 perspectivarns in the future. This change, this plan has been changed by Corona, but we're still going to get 3,000 perspectivarns, and this is what we're getting. So we should be ready for this, and we should basically have our theoretical framework as tuned up as possible for what's happening in the data, so we can capture an interesting effects if they start to appear. And that's what this map is really about. So what we want to do is we want to basically have a theoretical framework that lets us see small deviations from our order one understanding, which is the standard model, and lets us not just study LHC data, different measurements of LHC, but also incorporate other collider data, because we have all these other machines that ran in the past, and these things are running concurrently with LHC. We want to have a unified data analysis framework that lets us put things together coherently. And that basically is we basically want to see things like left and understand things at left and small deviations at left or lack of deviations at left and combine it with possible deviations in the Higgs properties or lack of deviations in Higgs properties LHC. So the way we do that is very straightforward, really. It's basically we're just breaking the standard models leading approximation when we're doing this map, and we're just doing higher dimensional operators, contact operators, extending things. So that lets us basically do that through a frame or combine these different data sets. Now that might seem simple, but actually as we start to dig into it, you'll see there's a lot of theoretical subtleties here, and it actually it's very interesting in terms of how we actually calculate precisely in this framework as we need to as the data set advances in terms of its precision. So where are we now? You probably cannot see this in detail. I, I put these slides online already so you can look for the, the slides in detail if you can't see uh, actually what's appearing here. But what this is showing you roughly is basically a comparison for many, many, many measurements for many different signatures at LHC. Uh, the theoretical prediction and the experimental result. And all you need to see is that order one, things are roughly working. We have an order one understanding, which is basically aligning with what we're seeing, and we're looking for small deviations, but we're not yet, if you look closely at this in, in the slides of detail, we're not really at percent level measurements that we can basically say that we're, we're, gonna, we're basically going to rule out the sort of things we're going to look for with these techniques already. We're getting to the point of percent level measurements at LHC and other facilities being combined in. And uh, that's basically where these techniques are most useful. It's based on the percent level in terms of precision. And you can see that here as well. We're not at percent level measurements yet, uh, but we're getting there. And, and as time will go on, we're going to be basically be able to, to get, get a lot of information out of that cell range. Okay, so hopefully that's enough of the motivation. If that's not enough of the motivation, about 10 years ago, when we were in Kevin and I were both at, at CERN, there was, of course, the discovery of a Higgs like scalar. And that basically put even rocket fuel into the rocket of EFT techniques because we essentially have the particle in the spectrum that makes these techniques even more sensible in terms of interpreting the data for reasons I want to basically discuss for the rest of, of this first session. So this is actually on the left. And you, when I see, when you see pictures of the Higgs, I'll kind of have an organizational framework where on the left, you usually see a diphoton measurement. On the right, you usually see a four lepton measurement, two essential measurements of the properties of the Higgs. And that's what you're seeing here, an actual di, uh, gamma measure, diphoton measurement and the, the four lepton measurement in terms of the Higgs. And if we start to see deviations in the properties of the Higgs, we want to basically be able to interpret that consistently considering everything else we already know, right? So what do we know? Well, one thing that we know, which is gonna be kind of embedded in what I'm gonna say going forward, is this thing at the top, which is JP equals zero plus, which basically means we've looked at the decay products of the Higgs, we looked at the angular distributions of those decay products, and we've convinced ourselves that basically this thing is it's zero, it's a spin zero particle of even parity. Okay, so that's basically going to be built into the theoretical framework that I'm going to be discussing going forward. Uh, and I'm not really going to dwell on that, how we've convinced ourselves to that in the past, because that's kind of like established knowledge now. But that's going to be an assumption that was going to be built in. What else is going to be built in? Well, its mass is about 125 GeV. It's a bump that's there, again, by both on and four left on the day. We're going to build this into our theoretical framework. Okay, so we want to basically study this as much as we can, as precisely as possible, and we want to be able to assume not just the standard model, but the standard model of perturbations when we make that theoretical uh, study and when we, we incorporate our information from the experiment. Okay, so what I'm going to try and motivate a lot going forward in a consistency way is that this scenario with the data 
uh, and with the limitations in terms of our experimental measurements, considering what we've discovered and what we're looking for, we're also the perfect techniques for effective field theory techniques, in particular this map. So what is being shown here on the left, these two lines are just overlaid on this, this constituent energy, uh, center mass energy for these different machines over the years. The top mass and the Higgs mass, two discovered particles, 175 and 125. And what's shaded in, in rows up there is something I would call the interesting scales. And what they are is basically a factor of four or five above those discovered particle masses. And we'll be going back and forth to basically discussing why those are interesting scales. And you'll notice that LHC is, is running at a constituent energy, which typically uh, is basically at the order of TV in terms of the partonic collisions that it's doing. So it's just poking into this interesting region, but it's not really fully saturating that interesting region. So that's why these EOT techniques are giving us a little more reach concerning the actual data set we're gathering. And, and what we want to basically understand, what I want to get you to understand over the course of these lectures, is this sort of idea, which is the scales that we know about, the BEV and lambda QCD, uh, are built into the particle physics description of the standard model. And if we basically have a scale that's a higher scale, especially with some heavy masses in this interesting region, then there's a self consistent argument that we're going to construct, which basically says that if we start to see small deviations, percent level deviations in the Higgs and other properties that we're measuring in LHC, that the cutoff scale of the theory associated with these heavy masses that we're basically not putting in as long distance propagating states in our theoretical description is going to be consistently in this interesting region, in the few TV region. And those will be leading to percent level effects and vice versa. And that's just kind of captured in this formula, which I'll show you the derivation of in a little while. It's just if we're looking for cross sections, looking at small deviations compared to the standard model, the scaling in terms of parameters is given here. This has to do with the number of degrees of freedom, essentially, in some new physics sector as couplings to the standard model compared to standard model expectation. We're scaling into the standard model expectation. And this is basically percent level in terms of the sort of parameters that we're interested in, in terms of perturbative properties of the case. Okay, so we really need a precision gauge cosmology program is the point that we're going to get to really consistently over and over. Okay, so let's start with what we knew way before the discovery of the Higgs, just part of its motivation, just as mostly as a reminder, hopefully to orient you in terms of this thinking. Okay, so before we talk about the standard model case, the more complicated case of non-abelian vectors, let's just think about the simpler case of just a U1 gauge field. Okay, so you could basically even start before you engage field, just think about a free fermion propagating field. Write down this mass, write down this kinetic term, right? This is the simplest thing you can do. It's what you've been learning in quantum field theory and that sort of thing. And someone can come along to you and say, well, I'm not just interested in a fermion propagating, but I'm also interested in a spin one field, a photon or something like that. And you can just write down this kinetic term so it propagates. And things get more interesting if you want those two things to interact and couple to one another, right? So if you want to couple them to one another, you can just couple the gauge fields in the usual standard way when you're talking about low dimension operator forms, where you write down a covariant derivative, you introduce a gauge field, you have a phase transformation, and the gauge field transforms in a certain way to basically have a symmetry be preserved, and you write down the usual Lagrangian that you're used to, the simple way of coupling a spin one field to a fermion field, right? Very straightforward. You're all used to this sort of thing. So it really is a sense this, this symmetry, which was a global phase rotation here, has been turned into a local symmetry by this procedure, these low dimension operator forms. And there's actually an accident here, but I'm not going to get into any of the detail. Uh, we can talk about it later if you wish. Because when you start out with higher dimensional operator forms, it's a bit different than AGH theory, but that's a separate conversation. Anyways, this is a very smart man who I have enormous respect for, who is a very unusual character in the history of physics. His name is Ernest Stuckelberg. I don't know if you've heard of him. You've probably heard of him. So he figured out something very interesting, which I'm going to try and emphasize here in terms of this leading to the standard model story. So, so let's say you took the Lagrangian before, and let's say you want to add a mass, which people sometimes want to do, right? Because first of all, you can see massive vectors, that would be interesting, and also just theoretically, can we add mass? So you can just write a mass down, and if you write a mass down, no, you know, lighting doesn't strike you, what's wrong? What's wrong is that you then look at those symmetry transformations we were talking about, the local gauge symmetry transformations, and that term is forbidden by those transformations. So you might say, well, that's that's just really simple, then that it's not allowed. But this guy was pretty smart, and he figured out that there's like a little trick you could do, which basically lets you write down that mass effectively. And I really mean the word effectively in the sense of effective field theory. So what he figured out is you can do the following. You got a scalar field. And so he did this, by the way, in like 1932, 38, sorry. It's like ridiculously smart, this guy. And he basically figured out that the scalar field you could add, you could have a covariant derivative act on the scalar field, coupling those gauge fields to it. And then basically, this scalar field could have a bet. And then essentially, you could basically get a mass out of that mechanism. So it's basically a proto Higgs mechanism that this guy figured out in 1938. And he's even smarter than that because he figured that, well, you can just take that bed and it can stick around, and then lambda can go to infinity, 
There's nothing wrong with that. But that removes the scalar from the spectrum, the, the, the fluctuating scalar field associated with this mechanism. And what you would then see at low energies in an effective field theory context is essentially what you wanted to write down plus some higher dimensional operators, which can be suppressed by a very large scale because this line is being taken to be very large and the mass scale of the scalar is being taken to be very large. So that's kind of fascinating that this guy produced in 1938. He was a total character. He was like really weird. He would show up at CERN with his dog and go into the theory room and just like basically, he was like super smart, but he was like super strange. So this, his work was a little underappreciated. Nevertheless, this is true. And you can think of this as an example of how you can write down a mass directly in an effective field theory sense. And when you retain the VEB associated with the scalar field, but remove the scalar field from the spectrum, you basically, basically retain part of the physics associated with that scalar field. And so you can think of that as a nonlinear realization of a symmetry. This is essentially what's going on. She wrote down an effective field theory with a nonlinear realization of that symmetry we were talking about before, which was the local symmetry. And then this is just perfectly fine to write down. There's nothing wrong with this. It's just that this theory doesn't work arbitrarily high energies. Eventually, these sort of operator forms come in to change your predictions. But that's fine. Okay. So this was kind of lost in terms of understanding. It's a lot, a lot of this sort of thing happens in the history of physics. People figure out something, and this is kind of like esoteric, and people forget about it. But it kind of hangs around it, and people rediscover things. And so this was rediscovered, I think, multiple times. And I think you're Philip Anderson, who's just shown here, knew this, essentially associated with uh, vector fields. There started to be increasing evidence that non-abelian vector fields would be around and that they would have masses in the 60s before the Higgs mechanisms are articulated in the famous Higgs papers came about. And he wrote this paper, and if you look at what he's saying here, he's basically saying explicitly, this is how we can remove bolts on bosons and give mass to the yang mills fields. So maybe we should do this. And he's trying to communicate to the particle physics community this exact message. So this is about a year before the famous Higgs papers and the other groups doing the Higgs mechanism. And that's the message essentially, is that when you see massive vectors, maybe you should be thinking about another phase. In that case, when there's a scalar that takes on a bed, this is what I mean by the other phase of the theory. Okay, so now let's think about that simple mechanism and apply it to the case of non-abelian gauge fields in the standard model before we discover a Higgs. So we have this sort of Lagrangian, and you can write that, uh, this Lagrangian with a nonlinear representation of a more complex version of that symmetry, that U1 symmetry. So when I say nonlinear in this case, you write down these sigma fields, which have some gold stones, let's use these sigma, sigma eyes here. Uh, as, those are the generators and the fires of the, the gold stone fields. And they basically can have more complex vectors, not just a U1, but an SU2 and that sort of thing. And you can also write down that sigma field and couple it in fermions. Okay, this is something people understood that you could do. And the only difference here compared to that more simple story is that there's now a self interaction of that gauge field, right? There's a non abelian vector field around, so there's this, this term here, which basically has two W's in that in this field string. And that means you have this cubic vertex, and that's essentially what makes it a little more complicated, makes the problem a little more interesting, but it also lets you do more physics. Okay? Later point not working. Sorry? Later, later point is working. Uh, it is, but I, just, I tend not to use the laser pointer because it's just distracting. Is, is everyone following? Do they want to see a dot move very rapidly? I can do that if you wish, but um, I just tend not to use the laser pointer. I'll use my finger. It's very, it's like powerful finger. It is a Canadian stick. Yeah, if I had a hockey stick, I would use it. We used to have a hockey stick in perimeter where we both were, they, they point with a hockey stick, but we don't have one. But I don't know what you have in Korea, some equivalent to a hockey stick. I don't know. You should have some cultural feature, like some, I don't know, sword or something. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, uh, use my finger for now. So, right. So that story, just like in the case of the Stuckelberg story, essentially gets you to write down mass by hand in an effective field theory sense with some higher dimensional operators and possibly a scalar field you haven't discovered yet. Right? That's the basic analogy. And so you just write this thing down. And then the problem which I was referring to, the problem is of the, the, the cubic term, the self-interaction of the vector fields, is essentially you start to do longitudinal polarizations. You do these sorts of diagrams, which we're talking about in some of those other lectures, and they're massive. And this polarization is longitudinal, so it closes the momentum. And if you actually calculate the amplitude there, what happens is, is essentially this thing grows with energy, as you know, with the Higgs mechanism being the solution to this. But what actually happens is first it grows as two more powers of this. When you write down those three diagrams, you cancel the leading Dependence, and then this is the, the residual problem that remains. But this grows with energy, and that also happens when you couple it to fermion fields, these massive vectors. Now, that's not intrinsically a problem because growing with energy, I mean, you can grow with energy, it's just eventually, if it grows with energy, the theory has to transition to another theory. Essentially, the theory has to break down at some energy scale. And that's what basically is the issue here. 
Um, and the people understood this in the late 70s and early 80s. So what's wrong when you have amplitudes that grow with energy that get too big? It's not the theology, this is physics, like what actually is the problem? So what's the problem? Is essentially that the way we recognize our theories, we want to have unitary evolution. We're using quantum mechanics. We have states. We want to have a unitary time evolution so that our states evolve to some other states. So there can be complicated dynamics of how that evolution occurs, but we basically want to have probability being preserved when that evolution is happening. And that means we have basically the Schrodinger equation. And if unitarity fails, essentially, you don't have this unitary, you don't have this evolution. And so something's gone wrong. You're losing some probability into something else, or, or something is just wrong with your thinking about how you set up the system. And it's usually that an approximation fails. And in this case, it's pretty obvious what the approximation is that must be failing, right? This theory was written down, this whole mass mechanism was just about some correction up to higher dimensional operators to some higher energy scale when the theory you know, breaks down. And that's exactly what is the, the situation. We introduce something called a cutoff scale lambda in an effective theory. And then we see the scattering amplitudes that we're calculating are only calculable in this theory up to that scale where this approximation starts to fail and it's dictated by the probabilities, the energies we give them big enough so probably it become better, bigger than one, right? So this is, a, this is a scale you associate with the effective theory itself, but then it usually is, 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 is basically standing in for a heavy mass scale that will come in to fix the problem with a new theory or a more complete theoretical description. Okay, so this is basically the solution problem, and that's what the cutoff scale of C lambda is, so is going to be uh, going forward. Okay, that's the cutoff scale in the EFT. Hopefully this is clear so far. Okay. So that's what I was just saying. And beyond the scale lambda, don't use the EFT. And it'll tell you lots of different ways to stop using the EFT. You'll get, you know, cross sections going negative, probabilities being greater than one. It'll just tell you stop. You should listen. Um, and this is basically the setup then. We have the scale B, and we have lambda BCD for the standard model. And we have, we're looking for small perturbations. And the small perturbations are going to lead to deviations in the properties of the standard model and scattering, which will cause the theory to break down. And even if we don't have a so lower energy scattering level well, mass effect, most of the theory will break down. And the theory will break down associated with some scale lambda. And the name of the game is what is the scale lambda? Right? This is before you discover the Higgs what would be the case. So this is a this is something we're going to push once we actually introduce a Higgs into this story. Okay. So why would you want to introduce something like a Higgs into this story? Why would you want to have a zero plus scalar around? To what, what, why would you? Care. Well, let's goes back to that Suckelberg example, right? That's basically the degree of freedom that's associated with giving mass to the vector fields in a way that is kind of like better UV completion. So you start with this Lagrangian that we have written down, and you just add a scalar field to this Lagrangian. And you just couple it into the degrees of freedom with some general coupling A and general coupling C. And what is it, what happens? Well, what happens is essentially you get the same answer with this correction factor if you work it out. And this correction factor, depending on the value of A, can make it so that this amplitude still grows with energy, but it can make the actual scale at which the theory breaks down go up. It can move the cutoff scale further away from the mass scales in the theory. And that can happen also with the scattering coming from the fermions. Okay, so that's why zero plus scalar is, is a good thing to look for if you have massive vectors around. And the way the numbers work, roughly, is essentially uh, the scale is going to be raised, the cutoff scale is going to be raised to four or five B. Okay, so this is basically the scaling how it works. So if you get couplings within 10% of the standard model case for the scalar, then you're going to have that rose colored region be in the few TVs range, which is kind of a self consistent theoretical uh, framework, even if the properties of the discovered scalar are not exactly standard model like, as long as the deviations are percentage level, then everything kind of fits together in a theoretical self consistent way. And we're using the OT. And that's exactly what these sort of analyses are about. Oh, look, she found a stick. It's not quite a sword, but it's um, So that's what these sort of analyses are about. Shall I try? Let's see if it makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. On that hand, okay. Okay, I'm gonna do this. All right. Right, that's what this is about. So this is basically an analysis at Atlas uh, where they're looking essentially at the couplings of the standard model Higgs. And it's not a very general EFT analysis, but it's just basically saying if we basically have a universal rescaling from the couplings to the fermions, we have universal rescaling of couplings to the gate fields, like those scattering stories I told you about, motivated by that physics. How close is the data basically sucking the standard model heat place scenario, which is exactly one one? That's exactly what the standard model heat is. And it's basically zeroing in on that. So that means we should expect small deviations, and we should expect a self consistent story with the standard model things in the spectrum to be something that just fits the data. So that's the standard model things. Okay? So Anderson wrote his story, and then about, if you look at the time, one year later, <laughs> enough time for physicists to read the paper, talk about it, think, 
type it up, give it to the people to publish it, and for it to appear. These three groups simultaneously did what they did in terms of this terminal takes and this terminal takes mechanism. So let's just remind ourselves of that as well. So the thermal hates just so this is in your heads, because uh, we're going to build on this in the EFT sense, is the following story. It's basically the story I was telling you about with an SU2 scalar public field. Okay, so we write down this kinetic term and this potential term, which you know is just like Stuckelberg sort of structure. And it's a complex scalar now, so there's two degrees of freedom here, there's two degrees of freedom here. The three SU2 generators are given here with this convention, and there's a hypercharge generator, which is diagonal. Right? And so the expectation value of the Higgs can be rotated in such a way as it's put down here. And then you have three broken generators and one unbroken combination of generators, which is going to be electromagnetism. This should just be a reminder, but I want to basically normalize and remind you of this. So this is the unbroken generator because that is zero when it passes back into expectation value. So what you usually do when you have this sort of story is you expand around your classical solution, right? And then you basically just your dynamics and your, your, your interpretation theory around that classical solution, which is just good here. Start expand around this back into expectation value. This will be the standard model takes. And this is basically going to be a massive scalar that you should look for. There's going to be some gold stones here, which will be eaten, and then given the mass to the W and Z exactly as you did in an effective field theory sense, but now with a UV completion into the standard model these mechanisms with SU2 scalar W. Good. So we expand on this kinetic term for the standard model Higgs. What you get is you get this mass term for W's. So this is this mass scale associated with the, the, the charge vector fields. And you get this complicated structure. And if you look at this complicated structure, you can basically put it in two orthogonal directions. One where there's a massless field, which is a photon, and the other one, which is associated with the unbroken generator, and the other one, which is a, a massive direction, which is the, the Z, which is also associated with hypercharge. You introduce, you introduce this rotation angle, this rotation rotation, uh, and this rotation angle just to basically do this uh, alignment to a photon in the Z. Good. Now, in the limit that you turn off hypercharge, you basically fill off one of these terms and you have a triplet of w's that are all the same mass you look at this and this combines up and it's the same mass okay so what it, so that's a triplet so it's a triplet under some symmetry group and that symmetry group is a triplet under is actually the custodial symmetry group and the reason i'm focusing on this is because going forward uh we're going to use symmetry as a guidance for all the parameters that are going to be introduced in this map so let's look at how the custodial symmetry works with the higgs and how loop corrections and small perturbations involving that sort of symmetry breaking actually orient our thinking in terms of electric precision data. Okay, so we have this triplet, these three W fields all have the same mass. If you look at them, they combine up to be the same. And it's basically the mass you can assign to this triplet, and you can also write down the, that mass in terms of this form. And the, this ratio you can construct, which is the row parameter, is one, essentially. This is basically the same expression. So this is there's a symmetry that this this uh, triplet of W's is uh, is a representation of, and it's essentially what we call custodial symmetry. So where is custodial symmetry hidden in this Lagrangian? So sometimes symmetries are a little bit difficult to dig out of the Lagrangian. You have to kind of think about the right way to write down the Lagrangian to represent the symmetry to make it a manifest linear symmetry. And it's true that's true here as well. So this, if you notice, if you look closely, you have a scu the doublet. Uh, scalar fields with four degrees of freedom. So this H dagger H, which is getting back into the H value, has this form. So that looks like there's an SO4 symmetry, right? You can just rotate these back to one another. And that's isomorphic to an SU2 left cross an SU2 right. And then you can basically make those SU2 left and SU2 right transformations in the scalar sector manifest by introducing this field, which usually we call a bi double field. And then we basically introduce this guy, which is usually an H tilde, and we can group these two H fields like this. And we group it in this way because then, then on this combination of fields, the left and the right transformations are literally on the left and on the right as linear transformation properties on that bi double field. That's why we introduce it and write it down this way. When you do the pasting on the back of the value in terms of this bi double field, it's just aligned along the diagonal here. And this basically is going to break these two symmetries down to a vectorial subgroup. And that's exactly what these two W's is a triplet under. So that's the, the what we call the custodial symmetry. And this is all a tree level story at this stage. It's just like how the tree level symmetry is working to break to break things and how it's built into this diagonal model. Now, this is not an exact symmetry, right? We only talked about this triplet when we turned off one part of what was coming with the covariant derivative, the part that was portion from the G1. So it's definitely broken by some interactions in the standard model. We can calculate them though, like in effective field theory, we can always calculate a part of the answer. Uh, and this and uh, also, there's like the fermion doublet splitting of this symmetry. So these are both calculable contributions. 
So if you ever have a situation where you have like a leading model understanding and you have a small perturbations which you can actually calculate in the theory, calculate them and just compare against experiment. And if symmetry is, is there to guide your what you want to calculate and what you don't calculate, use that to your advantage. So we're going to calculate and look at these effects and focus in on the breaking of hypercharge, the breaking of uh, this custodial symmetry by its temporal physics effects. Okay, so what are they? So these are the doublet fields, and this is the doublet fields uh, and the, the right-handed uh, singlet fields coupling to the higgs with these tau interactions. Right? You're used to the scope things, ten mol of margin. And if you look at these two-point functions, which are associated with mass the W and Z, and we're going to use mass that are using the two-point functions because we're focused in on those mass expressions, which we took the ratio of to build that thing called the row parameter, it was the W mass, and an expression which was equivalent with the Z mass. So we want to calculate a whole bunch of two-point functions and put in the effects of this doublet split. Okay. And the doublets are split when the masses are different than the two components of the doublet. The top part is very different than the bottom part in its mass. That's the leading splitting doing to these SU2 doublets. And if the pendants that it introduces is given here, the top part mass and the part mass, we calculate these two diagrams, will contribute to the row parameter in that way. Okay, and so because the top part is so different than the W mass, this is actually something we can see experimentally. It's a big enough effect that we can actually see this. It's not just that. We also have essentially two point functions being changed by the Higgs loops themselves. So even before you discover the Higgs, virtual effects of the Higgs like this, you can calculate and you can compare it against the data. And people did that in the left era. So these loop diagrams, if you calculate them, they give this logarithmic dependence on the Higgs mass. And you can add that to your contribution to the row parameter. And these two things you can basically look for in the data. Right? You can actually measure the W mass, measure the Z mass very precisely, look at the mixing angle that you infer very precisely. Put that thing together into the row parameter and compare against this, this, uh, this formula. And when you do that, that's exactly what's being done here. The residual, when you compare in that ratio comparing against your expectation, if it's exactly one, it tells you that basically your prediction is matching the experiment. And including these loop corrections, it's matching the experiment. And that's indeed the case. I mean, with this error, this Q signal. Essentially, electric precision data sees the loop corrections associated with the sort of symmetry breaking in a standard model things like mechanism, and it works. It's consistent with the data. Okay. And this is kind of non-trivial evidence, even before we found an explicit scalar like the Higgs that we would know roughly its mass and that the loop corrections associated with it is being seen in the experimental program decades before we actually found the Higgs, like in the early 90s. Yeah. Here's the data taken is that still is that is that still be after is that they uh, is that result still be after the, the recent WMS data? Uh, I'll get to the W mass. I'll talk about it in detail. That's a very good question. Uh, that is exactly if you took that measurement as the input, it indeed would introduce extra tension in this story. That's correct. Uh, we'll get to that. But right now, this is with this older left data, and this is the story coming into the Higgs discovery. Which is looking good. And it still looks good even with the W mass anomaly, which is pointing to a perturbation. But let me get to that. We'll get into it. There'll be a full discussion on that soon. Other questions? Please do ask. Yeah. Good question. All right. So since we're focused on mass, mass effects, and these like loop corrections, and we're looking at perturbations to the standard model story. What people did before they did the SMEFT analysis in the past was they basically looked at two point functions. They looked at two point functions like the W, two point functions like the Z, and they basically calculated them in models beyond the standard model. And they looked at loop, loop effects of this form, built up these combinations of two point functions divided by the Z mass. And that's something that people call the T parameter. And then basically, they also looked at this more complicated combination of two point functions. You can calculate it in any model you would write down that couples to the, the, to the W and Z, the mass vectors. And by calculating this, which we call the S parameter and the T parameter, you can basically constrain these models. You can basically say, well, if I add those effects in to the story of the standard model, how good is it consistent with the data, and how much do we actually place constraints on the model parameters which come in through these two-point function effects? And it leads to some pretty strong effects because it's associated with the symmetry breaking, right? So this is basically focused on custodial symmetry breaking. And this sort of analysis by these two shifts to the standard model story is really oriented around a symmetry breaking story and a perturbation to that symmetry breaking story in the standard model. Okay, so if you want to think about it in terms of not two point functions but operators, the modern approach is based in SMEP approach, which is not just these two parameters but a whole set of other parameters in addition, 
So if you start by basically taking that story of the T parameter and the, and the S parameter and pushing it into operator implementations, this is the first step. So basically there's an operator here, which is written down in this form, and it has this particular leading coefficient, which you can call the T parameter, and it's the same effect as what you were characterizing by those two point combination shifts. And there's another operator here, which has this definition, and it basically with this normalization is like the S parameter. Okay, so these you can you can think about as just two point functions you calculate in models, or you can think about them as operator effects that you use to interface with the data, but just two operators. Okay, but you can do this. This is this, this normalization, this choice of operator form is being done. This is the Warsaw basis which I'm going to be using, talking about this map going forward. I'm always going to be using this basis, which was written down first, believe it or not, in 2010. So, so it's kind of an interesting story about it took so long, but how can you that? So what you can do is basically you can look at the electric precision data story and you can basically look at the deviations that you get and constraints you get in terms of this S and T parameters, which you can think about in terms of two point functions, combinations of two point functions, or in terms of two Wilson coefficients of two operators. And it's basically this constraint once you combine up all these different pieces of data, which hasn't changed that much in recent years. But this is, of course, using the old W mass measurement as well. So this constrained region around zero, zero, and this is normalized to be these effects are zero if you're just exactly this type of model case, uh, tells you that basically if there are physics effects beyond the standard model perturbing the pattern of experimental measurements in terms of electron precision data, they can be there, but they have to be pretty small. There has to be a small perturbation to the standard model story, this, that, that standard model symmetry breaking story. Which is fine. Small perturbations like this correspond, as I've said a number of times, to mass scales that are high enough that you basically probably wouldn't see those states directly. There'd be a cutoff scale and such a description that basically you could consistently find by small deviations. And then eventually you'd find those particles in the few TG region once we actually have, you know, accelerators actually exploring that robustly. So you should be careful though, what I've done is I've shown you something which is this two parameter thing motivated at two point functions and then just worked on two operator forms. Okay, just two. There's a lot more operator forms that can come into this story, which we're going to get into in the complete analysis that we're going to be talking about later. But right now, this is just basically a hypothesis test of the standard model. We have the standard model Higgs mechanism, which I discussed and introduced. We have its symmetry breaking pattern. And then we're basically saying, well, around that symmetry breaking pattern of the standard model, around the standard model story, can we just say, is this consistent with the data? And you can just basically put two arbitrary deviations from the standard model S and T in. And just basically see how that's fitting the data and how constrained that is. But it's not a complete effective field theory analysis. It's just two parameters that you put in, not the full set. Okay, but it's, as, I, as you're hypothesizing the standard model, you can just do this sort of thing. That's okay. But you should not overinterpret this as a general result. The general result is actually quite less constrained. But the important point is these two parameters are motivated by perturbing around a symmetry breaking story. And parameters that are associated with symmetry breaking patterns in the standard model deviating from those symmetry breaking patterns can be strongly constrained from experiment. Those are the things that are the strongest constraints, usually, from what we get from experimental results. Uh, and that's indeed the case here. And that's going to be the case for flavor symmetry, which we're going to talk about as well, and other sorts of ways we're going to talk about the number of parameters that come into this map. There's a large number of parameters in this map, and you need to kind of orient your thinking in this way around symmetry breaking so that you don't like, lose your mind and there's too many parameters to actually interface with the data. Good. So this is what I was just saying. Let me just reemphasize it again. These ST analysis, they were not complete effective field three analyses. We're going to transition to doing those and talking about those. But they were not stupid. They were responsive to the actual data that was there at the time. One has to remember in the early 90s that there was no haze. <laughs> there was not even measurements of dye boson production. And there was like very limited measurements on left. It took a long time for the left program to really solidify in terms of its final data output. Okay, that was a huge effort in the field. So considering the state of the art of the field in terms of experiment, it was actually pretty smart to not try and do the total effective field theory analysis, but to do like this kind of step beyond the standard model in a limited sense because it was informative and was informed by trying to pursue what would the heck is giving mass to the W and Z? Is it just a standard model like Higgs? Any other new model? If it's actually changing the dynamics of electric symmetry breaking in an important way, will probably affect the mass of the W and C. That's the point, right? So it was motivated physically going after those effects. Now, remember we have the Higgs web built in, and we have these two loop functions built into our analysis of electric precision data. So at this point in time, I really want to emphasize this because people still do it. Post 2012 and post the last decade of data gathering at LHC, 
sticking with this ST analysis really isn't appropriate considering the data set now. It was certainly appropriate in the early 90s, it was fine. But nowadays we have to move forward and we have to do something more complete. And we can do that, and that's basically a solved problem now in terms of the leading effects in this map at dimension six. So that can be done and this being done. So people, please just stop doing just for ST analyses going forward because it isn't really reflective of the data set that's globally available. And this whole thing is built in in terms of the global data set, right? So we want to think about the more complex way that we can actually see physics beyond this time while appearing in uh, electric precision data. And what's really interesting, which I want to really emphasize to you, is once you start to think that way, you actually find some really cool stuff. Like one of the things that points to the geometric SMEF interpretation and basically that sort of formalism is the flat corrections that are in electric precision data. They have a very clean interpretation in terms of pointing to this geometric structure and this way of thinking in field theory. And that information has basically been around for decades. And we just had to kind of look at the data the right way and what it was telling us with that theoretical interpretation to basically understand the message that was there. So doing things more complicated is actually kind of informative in terms of field theory in terms of the general interpretation of that. Okay. So I want to talk, so maybe I should pause here for a second because I just gave you a lot of information. Most of that was supposed to be reviewed because you should have seen that in your like PhD programs and that sort of thing. But maybe I should just pause for a second before I go on to ask if there's any questions on what was said because there was a lot. Really? Perfect. Everyone's tired, one of two. Remember there's another lecture. So if you slow me down in this lecture, then the other lecture will be more understandable. Okay, yes, question. I can hear you too, maybe. Oh, maybe for the Zoom people, you should use the microphone. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, I mean, when you uh, explain this uh, derivation of the Schiffel duck around them for mm -hmm. uh, gauge field, uh, you sent this coupling number to infinity. The full theory with this. I'm just wondering whether this, I don't know, uh, effective field theory can be straightforwardly derived from a strongly, I don't know, coupled or non perturbative uh, theory. Ah. There is a no problem, I don't know. Yeah, so I mean, it's parametrically being taken away from the mass scales retained in the problem. So lambda is not present then in the, uh, the the mass that remains for the vector field in that case. So it's just a parametric separation. It doesn't have to be actually infinity. You can just think that lambda is becoming like five or 10 or something, depending on the mass that you introduce. Essentially what you're doing, which I'm gonna get on to talking about during the scales, is you're, you're built, it's a theoretical framework that lets you have a parametric, you know, a separation, parametric, literally parametric, in terms of the mass scales you remove versus the mass scales you retain in that case, the mass scale of the, folk, of the vector field. And the parametric separation in that case is because there's a parameter, lambda, which is present in the one case associated with the other mass scales you remove, which is not uh, present in the mass scales that you've retained. So it doesn't have to become formally strongly coupled and not perturbative and like everything breaking down uh, for you to actually do that separation. Uh, it tells you that if you go in that direction and keep pushing the cutoff scale higher and higher, likely this story still works but you lose calculational power and you should always be careful when you have non perturbative physics appear to not over claim. I'm big on that. So let me just say it, it implies that, that it will still work this way parametrically. Thank you. Is there other questions? Okay, I'm gonna slightly go on, but please feel free to interrupt me or stop me as I go on. Okay. So let's talk about cutoff scales. I've introduced, so you're probably at this point able to even guess how the story is going to go, right? You saw it in the case of the simple U1 with Stuckelberg and how everything worked up to a cutoff scale with some other effects. Uh, and you saw how the standard model Hanks mechanism, you can just think of it as like a more complicated version of that. And so the, then the key question is essentially, does it really fit together consistently theoretically? So when you do the standard model. Okay, so the standard model, we have this linearly realized gauge theory. This is my Lagrangian. I'm just telling you this just for the sake of fixing my notation, which will be consistent going forward. And we've introduced the Higgs mechanism. We have the magnetic term for the Higgs, and we have this potential term, and we have this whole spectrum of states in, in, in the theory. So, as I mentioned, 
the standard model you can think of as a very, very special case of a very general story involving just having a zero plus scalar, which raises the cutoff scale. So what is the standard model? So normalized to the standard model values, the standard model is exactly the case where this coupling that you've introduced of these massive vectors to the scalar field that you've introduced and the coupling of this, this uh, scalar to the fermion fields is exactly going to cancel this high energy growth. That's the special nature of the standard model case. And that's why it's a renormalizable theory that basically you don't necessarily have to write down these higher dimensional operators, right? Because it really kills this high energy growth. It's, the standard model case is a unique and exact super special case, which exactly kills that high energy growth. That's the way you should think of it. But there's lots of reasons to think there's physics beyond the standard model. Uh, we're not going to get into that in great detail, but I hope you're already exposed to many of those ideas, the issues of the hierarchy problem we'll talk about, generally things like dark matter, all sorts of things which we can think of as perturbations to the standard model story, which have to couple into the standard model to some degree. And as soon as you change that very unique situation of the standard model things having exactly the standard model things like properties and no other things coupled in, you start to perturb the story, even small perturbations break that very special case of the standard model Higgs. And there will be a cutoff scale introduced. And the only question is, it's a very interesting question, which we should go after experimentally with UT techniques, what is the cutoff scale? How big are the perturbations to the standard model story? Right? That's basically the question nowadays. So if you want the theoretical framework that is used to basically go after that question, it's basically we take the standard model as the leading term, and we put the perturbations down that we can write down consistently. Now, the first time this sort of thing was done, which was actually quite interestingly in the late 70s, uh, was essentially this something called the Weinberg operator. It was also done by Wolchek at the same time in the same year. And that can give neutrino mass. Uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. And it's actually a nice message and, and indicator that we're kind of thinking in the right direction, considering the smallness of neutrino mass. If you have like a seesaw mechanism, that sort of thing. It's a higher dimensional operator associated with left number violation, and it has a cutoff scale associated with it. We're going to talk a lot, and this math for about the last 10 years was basically the development of this dimension six perturbations in a self consistent way we interface with collider data, and then looking at how they change the story. And if you were going to use what I call the Warsaw basis, but there were some other works before leading up to that. This is actually an important one with the compiler, but this is the basis we're going to use when we talk to the town. And this perturbation is something that's very well studied. We're really going to pound on that. And going forward, by the end of the week, if we want to go beyond this dimension six dot, go to dimension eight, that's when you get into more technical problems. But luckily, kind of wonderfully, that's when the geometric approach kind of comes in to make it so that you can do those calculations very easily. And actually the theory quite thoroughly tells you to think in that direction. And I'll give you the reasons as to why it basically gives you that message. So that when we go forward, we're not just talking about dimension six perturbations, we really start to think geometrically. And that's what I want to convince you of over the next couple of hours. I can move forward. I'm almost done this. Let's go. Here, go. Okay. So you've heard this story. I'm just kind of re-emphasizing it. The standard model case, you write down the SMAP Lagrangian as the perturbations to the standard model. And then you write down a whole bunch of higher dimensional operators. We're going to write down the Warsaw basis. The operator forms are given by Q. There's this cutoff scale, which is really a parameter in the effective theory. It's where the theory breaks. We shouldn't use it beyond that scale. And then there's some parameters that we don't know yet. There are Wilson coefficients. There's some unknown numbers, essentially, extending the standard model. And uh, depending on your UV completion, they have a different pattern. They're generally thought to be order one, but we don't know them. We want to basically find them from the data. And the pattern of them from the data tells us about the underlying physics that's actually there. So when you actually have this perturbation around, in terms of the properties that takes, what happens? Well, basically, you start to disturb this from this very spectacularly special case where it exactly cancels off the higher energy growth in the case of standard model things because you change through these higher dimensional operators being here some of the relationships in the standard model with a slight perturbation. And that slight perturbation appears in these scattering formulas as a function of these Wilson coefficients. And if it's basically this sort of scattering for low phase space regions, phase space regions which are near the standard model states in terms of lower energy scattering, then it poses a B squared over lambda squared times some function. And if it basically is going at higher energies, which is the case for the breakdown of the theory in this argument, it goes like S over lambda squared, or T. Same thing happens with the scattering of fermions into massive vectors as well. 
you basically get higher to growth over lambda and then some unknown, some combination of these, these loss coefficients, which you can actually calculate. So again, this is basically straightforward. You can actually execute these calculations. You can see this, this is the scaling that actually appears. And then this theory has a cutoff scale, it breaks down. And that's exactly what this picture is. Depending upon this particular combination of pattern of C's, which you actually can choose for your different UV scenarios, you get a cutoff scale, and where it exactly is above the bed depends upon the values of C that you, you've chosen. Okay? But it will be parametrically above B, is the important point. It doesn't go below B. Okay? So it will break down, and then it's a question of where it breaks down, and that's what we're after with SNAP studies. We want to figure out this pattern, and we want to figure out where this cutoff scale is, and then we want to basically use that to basically go forward and, and learn what's going on beyond the standard model description. Now, there's two parameters that are expansion parameters, which I've been kind of emphasizing here at different times. And this is a kind of an important story that there's these two expansion parameters, and that one of them we're actually going to be able to basically solve the theory in for low endpoint functions as all orders when we use geometric techniques. That's this first expansion parameter. So, what this is, is essentially v squared over lambda squared. Things that don't change kinematics can sometimes appear like this in perturbations of the Higgs properties or other standard model properties, standard model state properties. And if it goes to v squared over lambda squared, we have a lot of calculational power using geometric techniques, as you'll see. That's one expansion parameter that's there. And it's the relevant expansion parameter when you're actually doing measurements that are dominated by standard model phase space populations. Okay, so if you have some intermediate state that goes on shell or near on shell, then that's the expansion parameter in terms of perturbations that's quite relevant for the data. But it's just one of the expansion parameters. There's another one, or a set of them, that are also around, which can be novel kinematics. Okay, so you can basically have derivative operators around, which lead to growth in energy, which is stronger than the standard model. And this set of expansion parameters is also important. It really matters in the sense of going to higher energies, tails of distributions, which would indicate the cutoff of the theory. It is important when you're not focused on scattering, which is dominated by some intermediate standard model stable and not shell. Okay, so both of those things happen experimentally, and they are just two expansion parameters are around, and they actually have a very different character in the theoretical description in this map, which we're going to talk about a lot. Okay, but both of these are around. Yeah, so this is what I was just saying. This one, to reemphasize, you have better theoretical control using geometric techniques. It doesn't change the phase-based populations, and it's actually less operators. There's actually much less operators in terms of the dimension 8, dimension 10, dimension 12, as you'll see. Uh, and this one has less theoretical control, but it's more sensitive to the breakdown of the theory, which we're kind of after to figure out where the cutoff scale is, to figure out what's going on. Okay, so these are they're complementary in nature. They're both around. Okay, I want to mention one brief thing, which Rodrigo is going to talk about a lot in more detail. So this is just to orient you to have a couple into his lectures, okay? I'm going to talk about the SMEFT, and the SMEFT is the perturbation to the standard model story. So you saw that I was basically saying there's a, there's a Higgs mechanism, there's an extra two-scalar doublet, and we're doing relative corrections in the standard model, and then we're going to go to higher dimensional operators, which have that extra two-scalar doublet built into it. That's the SMEFT. But the story I just told you, you can basically, if you're just going really bottom-up, like I was motivating it, you could also just kind of stick in that sort of bottom-up way without assuming that extra two-scalar doublet was there, right? You wrote down the sigma field, which has the three gold stones, which give mass to the vectors already. You can write down this singlet that you put in the field, put in the, in the spectrum with the general coupling. You can just do this, like the Stuckelberg case. And if you don't assume that this guy has a specific relationship to these three degrees of freedom in an SU2 scalar doublet, this is something you can also think about as a bottom-up effective field theory. There's nothing wrong with it, it just doesn't have the set of assumptions which is present in this map. Which has the standard model as its leading term of perturbations. This is also allowed, and in some sense, it's more aligned with this sort of bottom up approach of Stuckelberg sort of things. This is the hat. Okay, this is the distinction. This is a different effective field theory. It has uh, a set of parameters. The SMEF has a set of parameters, and essentially, what happens is the SMEF is more constrained in terms of the patterns and deviations from the standard model that it allows compared to the hat at least at low operator mass dimension. And Rodrigo is going to talk a lot about this, so I'm going to leave it to him. But that's basically uh, where you couple into his lectures, because he's going in this direction of this more general description, not this map. Okay, so you can just write this thing down. You can write down the entire dimensional operators with the gauge fields coupled to the sky. Uh, so this is one of those things that's a bit of convergent physics evolution. So 
I actually was someone, one of the many people that rediscovered this theory with Ben Greenstein in like the late 2000s. And I was super excited at the time that it was super important. And everyone who discovers this theory finds it, finds a lot of excitement in it because it's really cool. It seems right. Um, but eventually I learned that in the 90s, <laughs> other people had kind of realized that that also exists. And in fact, this paper, my third below really makes it clear. And Burgess also knew when I talked to Cliff at some point, he's like, oh yeah, I know about that. But it wasn't so clear in his paper, but there's also a paper about Bagger. There's a whole bunch of papers, but basically people keep rediscovering this. Five minutes? I'm all done. Yeah. And there's a reason they keep rediscovering because it, it is basically following the mantra of vector field theories, right down the general thing bottom up with the, you know, the, the states that you assume in the spectrum, and then just write it on everything and just go for it. So it's, a, it's kind of a nice thing. It's been rediscovered at least four times independently, and that's usually a good sign in terms of physics. But it's kind of an amusing historical learning for how that came about. So in this case, you write down these general guys, and I've color coded them here with this sort of scattering. And going bottom up, you basically just do that scattering, and you basically get these more complicated formulas, which I'm not going to go into any detail where Rigo is going to talk more about that sort of thing. But it's similar to the SMAC. Okay? You basically get a power counting in terms of the parameters that you're introducing here. There's cutoff scale, there's the scale f that's being introduced, the subtleties, which are Rigo will go into. And these sorts of scatterings, as you can just figure out these formulas, these two groups basically have the same formula, but they derive it in very different ways. We argue that it's the same formula. And essentially, this sort of indication, the order one message, although it's subtle, is that the heft should lead to larger deviations in the properties of the observed scalar and lower cutoff scales. So he'll talk about that in great detail. But that's basically the order one message. Small 1% level below perturbations is kind of a more snap like direction. Larger perturbations kind of aligns more with the heft description. Just think, I mean, it's subtle, but that's basically the, what, what the story is. And we'll tell you about that. Okay. We can kind of get this and it fits and it's a self consistent DFT with the cutoff scale as well. Okay. So, how is the cutoff scale working? Do we see new states? All right. The answer is no. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Uh, <laughs> We wish we did, but that's the case. So what we see is the following. So these are this is a whole set of searches. This is like this isn't even close to the number of searches they've done in an experiment. And there's are individual models where they're basically looking for some bump or some kinematic feature, which is different than the standard model. They're not seeing it, and they're turning that lack of seeing that deviation into a constraint on essentially uh, a deviation, which is associated essentially with a cutoff scale of the theory. And they're usually assuming some couplings when they're doing that. But this is basically what they're doing. And the only thing you need to see here is basically this is a log plot on the bottom. And it goes from about you know, 10 to minus 1 to 1 to 10 TV. Okay? So down here is the, the states, the scales that we talked about, the VEV, lambda QCD, the standard model states. So down there are the mass scales of the things that we see, including this inflated scalar, the top, the Z, the W. And the rose-colored region I talked about is up here. I think we can do this. Yeah. Okay, so that where you're still hoping for physics beyond the standard model because you haven't completely saturated the searches into that sort of region of, 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 of scattering is basically up here. And self consistently, if you turn this on its side, you can see the picture I was showing you before. That's basically what the situation is. Now, all of these searches and all the other ones that were being done were not just here, but like way out here. Then I would work on cosmology, <laughs> which I do at times because I'm in. But the point is, is not. It's only out to here. Okay? And this is the reality of what the experimental constraints are. And so if you want to basically probe into this intermediate region, which is very interesting to go after with the current and future collider data, EFT techniques are the way to do it. Because the direct searches are kind of cracking out in terms of their ability to push these bands in this direction. So we have to use the theoretical techniques of EFT. And it's self-consistent to do so. These bounds have been pushed away from this mass scale. But there's still possibilities of physics beyond the standard model showing up as small perturbations with these cutoff scales in the QTE region. And when we do that, we get a great simplification, which is that we basically can expand in these ratios. Okay? This being visually different than this gives you calculational power. And if you're a physicist and someone says, well, you can tailor expand, you tailor expand. So you can basically tailor expand in these two ratios. And that's essentially what this map is. It's a Taylor expansion with the assumption that the leading terms of Taylor expansion are the standard model. And that's really useful because then the appearance of perturbations to the standard model properties in different measurements gets correlated because of the operator forms you've introduced. Okay, so that's actually a really useful thing to do. 
I'm done. Don't worry. Yeah, I'm done. I'm closing it. Uh, so the, the, the story is that there's no Leon's thermal resonances that we've seen. We have this decoupling expansion. And then we get basically to the SMAP, which is the subject of the lectures I'm going to give, or the HAP, which is what Rodrigo is going to talk about. But we have a self consistent theoretical structure when we assume no other light hitting states, which we could also write down if we wanted to, but that's just an orthogonal direction of the theory. And then we get this sort of Lagrangian. The standard model is the leading term, higher dimensional operators, unknown parameters, and cutoff scale. And it all fits together beautifully in terms of interpreting the actual data set that's present. Okay, so let me just give you just a, two minutes of really important words about why this works at all. Okay. Why does this work? It's a good question, right? I'm going to put down local operators, and I'm just going to say, well, these local operators with this Taylor expansion actually capture the physics of all possible UV physics that you basically could write down, which you then basically do this Taylor expansion. Why the heck should that work? Why does field theory work that way? So this is actually a formally established result. So I don't have time to go into that, but I'm going to basically point you to where you can look literature to prove to yourself that that's the case. And basically what's happening is essentially very similar and very much in the lectures you heard from the other speakers earlier today, you start to think about the S matrix itself and its properties and what properties it can have to motivate this sort of approach. So it's basically an analytic function of some invariance, the S matrix, and it, it's only in special regions of phase space where things go on shell essentially uh, that you, you basically lose that analyticity, you have resonance, essentially. So if you're basically doing collisions and you're not exciting an intermediate state on shell, making a resonance, then you can tailor expand this guy, this propagator. And you can tailor expand in general the dependence on that heavy mass scale compared to the kinematics that you're actually probing in those S matrix calculations that you're doing. And that dependence on that heavy mass scale gets simplified in that case. And that's essentially the underlying idea of effective field theory, which is also underlying and basically built into Cliff's lectures and the lectures of the other speaker earlier today. And then what happens is essentially that heavy mass scale dependence is sequestered to be what you're, whether I've worked in here as an assumption, that you write down these higher dimensional operators in dimension six and dimension eight, and then heavy mass scale associated with the cutoff scale is sequestered down below. And in the numerator, you can have V squared or kinematics. But it does work this way in general formal field theory. The people that prove that it works this way in general formal field theory are the following. These people, you can actually look at what they wrote, and you can actually see that they have actually been able to renormalize the theory and control the divergences in terms of these local analytic operator forms that can be written down. And this also got established in something called the decoupling theorem by, by, by basically Alquisten and Cazon. That was in the US. And there's also a paper which is basically doing the same thing in Germany at the time. Less communication, there was a Cold War, people weren't talking so much. Um, and it happened both in Europe and North America. This general formal establishing what I just said on the previous slide, that that heavy mass scale dependence for lower energy scattering diagrams is sequestered in that way. And the formal proofs are here. Now, frequently nowadays, no one believes it unless Witten says it's true. Witten said it's true too, and he's right. So he applied that general result to these two very influential papers in the mid-70s, deep elastic scattering and basically weak interaction studies. And you can actually see him formally developing all the stuff I've been talking to about. He takes something heavy, it gets captured in terms of local operator effects. And this is using EFT techniques, importantly, for the standard model physics. Okay, so they were talking about the other quarks that were too heavy to see, and they're building that into their theoretical description. And they compared it against actual data before we actually found those actually heavy heavy quarks at the top part of that sort of thing. And it works. And it also is a very influential paper by uh, someone that I learned from as well, Mark Wise, on using weak interactions. Again, standard model effects and mixing and that sort of thing. Taking the heavy particles in the standard model, integrating them out, using these techniques to see what happens in face with the data, checking as the data, and it works. Okay, so it's not just that it's an opinion, it actually works for the standard model as well, interfacing with the data. You can look at those papers. And this was actually kind of revolutionary when people did this at the time, because this was in the 70s, and you didn't just you hadn't discovered any of those things explicitly that are x on that diagram. And they were using those techniques to indirectly infer the presence of those states and see what they would do to perturb the results that they were actually calculating compared to experiment. And it worked. And that nowadays we're just doing the same thing, but with heavier states that we haven't found, which we speculate are around, and then we're capturing in terms of these lower dimensional operator effects. Okay. So that's why this is a consistent story. Hope you've been convinced of that. We live down here, but we're pretty sure up here exists 
in terms of these perturbations leading to a cutoff scale, as soon as you change the properties of this time model things even a little bit, instantaneously, you start to generate a cutoff scale, which will be below the point scale, right? So it's pretty likely that whatever else is going on in the UV, it couples to the standard model at some point, especially to the H dagger H operator, which is a singlet. And that's why this is a consistent picture, which we're going after. I think I'm done. Okay, that's it. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, are there questions? There should be questions. Doubts, accusations. Yeah. Uh, so suppose this head particle that is mass part, part of its mass from the uh, standard model Higgs boson is mm -hmm. behaving. Then, uh, can you just uh, so can you just make it couple or? It's a bit tricky. So uh, the, if it gets a large component of its mass from the Stairmall Higgs from the BEV, then uh, like the Stuckelberg case, if you take that heavy particle um, and remove it from the theory, then essentially you get as a low energy effect, the, the sort of heft description, which Rodrigo will talk about in detail. So one thing you should also think about in terms of um, heft versus the SMAT is if you basically have large Large, this is what I was saying. If you have larger couplings to the Stairmall Higgs, bigger perturbations, Stairmall Higgs properties, therefore a larger component of the mass of the, of the particles coupled to the Higgs comes from the Higgs mechanism. That self consistently fits together as more moving in the heck direction. The way you see it in the SMAP, you can still capture it frequently, but what you, what you will find is that the series expansion doesn't work very well. Like the dimension six operators get big corrections from dimension eight or dimension 10. It still can be convergent. But it's big corrections, and you get a little better convergence in the case of the heft. So there's papers by Nathaniel Craig showing that in collaborators recently, and I think Rodrigo will talk about that quite a bit. So you can still capture that in an EFT paradigm, but it it basically moves the direction of a nonlinear realization. Are there more questions? We'll get to the hard stuff in about half an hour. Yeah. Sorry for this sort of naive question, which I am explaining this. So you have to determine the risk function from the, the experiment observes, yeah. observ uh, observation, right? So, um, I mean, in real, uh, we can compare the number of the, the risk function we can have to determine with the realistically uh, uh, the Experimentally, can see the observable risk. Yeah, we can, we can compare the numbers. Mm -hmm. so. I'm going to do that. I'm going to get there. Yes, which, we can. Which is, I mean, bigger. I'd say. Ah, so that's a very good question, and that would that and that basically gets to the point of is there calculational power in these techniques? So like, this is what I was saying about the ST approach before uh, in the '90s when there wasn't as much data. It wasn't a full EFT approach, but it was two parameters, and it was more aligned with the actual data. The SMAT, in terms of the dimension six analyses, we'll talk about that in great detail very soon. The number of parameters in general at dimension six is very large. However, the number of parameters that come into the observables that can get precise is much smaller, and on the order of 30. So the data has improved enough, and going forward, we will have enough precise measurements combining LEP combining some low energy measurements and combining King's property measurements in particular, also some dive boson measurements. If we can push that CAC and also a little bit of, not really top work data, but like one particular aspect of top work data, which we can get somewhat precise. If we can push those things to percentage level precision going forward, then I think we have enough measurements to actually have a closed theoretical description and actually have some useful calculational constraints and power in this paradigm at dimension six. So I was convinced of that about 10 years ago, and I think it's true, and now it's kind of become standard in the field at dimension six. But the, the, the more difficult question was always, what about dimension eight? Or what about the loop effects? I'll talk about that, I'm gonna to get to that. And to be honest, a lot of us were very pessimistic about the dimension eight stuff. And we took basically the approach of, well, let's get the dimension six results sorted out, 
and at least get the experimentalist doing that correctly. And then if dimension eight is too many parameters, we'll deal with that when we need to deal with that. But it actually turns out very surprisingly in a very cool way, uh, which I'm gonna try and get across to you, that the dimension eight story is much better control. And the reason for that is these geometric techniques in the geos maps I'm gonna tell you about. Uh, very surprisingly, but now a little bit obviously, I guess, um, the number of parameters that come in at dimension eight is not enormous for the things that can get precise for similar reasons that the number of parameters that come in at dimension six for the things that can get precise experimentally is not enormous. It's because the two expansion parameters I mentioned, the h dagger h over lambda squared expansion parameter and then the pi dot pj, they actually have a very different character in terms of the number of operator forms that they introduce and therefore the number of Wilson coefficients they introduce independent of mass dimension. And that leads to us actually having better calculational control. So this is a meaningful program, even thinking about dimension eight effects uh, going forward. So I think it's actually, we can actually do this and actually be meaningful about this. It's pretty surprising, what might think, because the number of parameters, but you'll see why as we go through the week. Thank you for your presentation. Actually, your presentation is quite clear, so it is hard to make some questions. Anyway, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I believe in you. <laughs> and anyway, so, right. so in my understanding, the standard model tracking, there is no WL plus W, W plus to, to w, minus, w minus to W plus W minus process and yeah. terminal and terminal to W, w plus minus, W plus minus process. Mm -hmm. There's constraints, yeah. But so yeah. this is maybe my maybe I uh, can I couldn't I couldn't state but anyway if both process uh offer the experiment right? I'm not sure I heard exactly the process you're referring to, but I think what you're referring to is that for some of the vector boson couplings, the operator forms are limited at dimension four and below, so you don't have all velocity configurations period. I think that's what you're referring to. Um, and you're right that that's the case in the standard model that that's forbidden. And then we start to do higher dimensional operators and some I'll, I'll, I'll get to, you can actually start to have those sorts of couplings. That's true. Um, so that, so that's related to, so there's many accents at dimension four and below, just because of low dimension operator forms. Um, and many of those accidents are related to essentially vector fields coupling to other vector fields and basically how those theories are gauged and therefore the holistic configurations that can interact. Uh, so I could go on about that a very long time, um, but I'm not sure it's useful for me to do it yet. But I, let me just say that you're right that when you go to low dimension off operators, dimension four and below, there are list, there's constraints on holistic configurations for mass effective bosons that can appear in scattering. And as you go to higher dimensional operators like dimension six and above, one of the things that's interesting about higher dimensional operators is it allows some of these holistic configurations to happen for scattering associated with that to happen. And coming along with that is this extra growth in energy that can happen in some of these scattering processes, this extra growth in S and P and that sort of thing. Um, there's nothing intrinsically special about dimension four and below operator forms. Other, the, the traditional or normalizability point of view, uh, for a long time, people thought that for field theory to make any sense, you basically had to restrict yourself to something which was an old school or normalizable interactions only at the dimension four. And um, that was basically a misunderstanding of the power of field theory. You can always do effective field theories, you can always have theories which are more normalizable in the modern sense, the Wilsonian sense, where you just basically can subtract the divergences at each order, dimension four, dimension six, dimension eight, dimension 10. And because there's an expansion parameter, which gets smaller as you go up with mass dimension for the operators, it's still a meaningful thing to do. So there's nothing really wrong with, and nothing special about the standard model retaining dimension four and below. And having these extra operator forms around is perfectly fine. It leads to higher energy growth, but we have, we have what I'm trying to emphasize, a self-consistent theoretical framework in which we can incorporate those interactions. And it is fine. It's not something that is 
that's intrinsically and theoretically inconsistent. It's actually not perfectly not. Thank you. Oh, you know, uh, what the oh, it might be a dumb question, but those are the best questions. <laughs> Do you have a strong reasoning that you believe that there is a, actually a scale and heavy between the bad and the constant? Do I have a strong reason? Um, it must exist, right? So there is one reason, which is kind of interesting, um, which is that if you actually just run the standard model up and you ask yourself the question, how far can it go self consistently? before there's some theoretical inconsistency that appears. This is like the most minimalist thing. Forget about dark matter, forget about, you know, it's just purely gravitational or whatever. And, you know, nothing, you assume nothing else exists, which is coupled to the standard model. You say, let's just run the standard model up, see how far we can go. It's kind of like the minimal thing, right? You don't actually get to the Planck scale with current calculations. So this is uh, something people have been studying a lot. They do these higher order calculations, these RG effects, like three loop effects and two loop calculations. Uh, and they run the standard model up consistently. And because of the, the particular values of the top part mass and the Higgs mass that we now know, uh, it turns out that the standard model potential, it, as, as you run it in energy, what happens is it essentially flattens. So it essentially like goes from this to essentially being flat. And it essentially also then turns over if you go up in higher energies. And when it turns over, that's bad because then the theory is unbounded from below which is a way of saying it's just theoretically inconsistent. That does not happen at the Planck scale. It happens at about 10 uh, PV. So that's pretty high <laughs> beyond our current experimental measurements. And if all of the need for physics beyond the standard model was associated just with that, then these techniques, the effects would be, it could still be self-consistent. You, you do the perturbations this way, you would say cutoff scale is up there, but it would be too small to see experimentally. But that is like a solid reason to think that below the Planck scale, something has to happen. Um, something has to happen when that occurs. Now, some people say what they do is they talk about this. There's papers on this, a lot of them that are pretty famous. They talk about the fate of the universe because they're worried about the standard model potential turning over. Um, so they speculate about the universe decaying and all these sorts of things. The decay of the universe associated with that is so long that we're not going to die. <laughs> but um, it does point to the theoretical inconsistency in the theory. Which is at a lower scale than the Planck scale. And as soon as you put in dark matter or anything else coupled to the standard model, um, then you basically pull the cutoff scale down even lower when the mass scale of what you couple to the standard model is lower. So that's basically the paradigm. Thank you. Do you have a reason to believe that there's the impact of the lower Planck scale? Below the, the reason, do you have a reason to believe that? Part the below the weak scale. The weak scale. Below. Below like the weak scale. Below. Below the bad. Below the electron weak scale. It just. Well, I mean, including neutrinos. The neutrinos in the game. Um, not really. I mean, people speculate about that. They like to solve the strong CP problem with light particles, with axions. They like to do all sorts of things with dark matter, which can be light. They can be, but they don't have to be. Um, so I don't have, I mean, you ask me, I, I don't have, <laughs> if you ask a model builder, they'll tell you for sure. It's exactly, this is the greatest reason ever. And it's my model that does it. That'll be the way it works. But for me, I don't have a strong reason to think below the weak scale that would need to happen in their state. I don't know. As long as neutrinos are already massive and they're there. I think that we are around 10 minutes. We can start at 4.40. I, I mean, I can oh, anytime you want, I can start. I can start now. Whatever. Okay. Thanks for the uh, speaker again. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think in these calculations, they neglect the gravitational effects, but I think they're known to be small. But they do take into account gravitational, they worry about gravitational effects changing the tunneling rate. Um, but that's always a very small effect. 